Uh, thanks, thanks very much for having me. I'm really stoked to be here. Um, I, uh, today I wanted to share, so, so I'm Susan Potter, and uh, today I wanted to share with you some things that I've learned over the last uh, few years of um, trying to lead teams and trying to adopt functional programming at different organizations, and um, the last, uh, putting into practice some of um, the lessons hard learned um, over the last two and a half years at my uh, current uh, job. Um, so, um, uh, so um, you can, like, if uh, you, you know, ask questions, of course, but um, if uh, you want to ask me questions later on, uh, here are house to um, uh, contact me. And um, I babysit a uh, bloated Rails app, so it's not all unicorns and uh, rainbows, um, but, uh, but I also get to build new services in Haskell. And uh, we build out, uh, we've built out some test and development productivity tools in Haskell as well. And, um, and so we've, we've, we've been adopting functional programming with, you know, using Haskell at a Rails shop. And, um, and uh, so here's some of the insights that I've learned along the way. Um, so the word discipline really has two primary definitions, one related to punishment and one related to knowledge. And I don't know about you, but when I was first starting to learn functional programming, um, I felt quite a lot of punishment. Um, and, uh, but you know, in my current role, my goal is to, to kind of um, limit that as much as possible for the team that I'm onboarding, that, that I'm, t I'm, I'm bringing on board. And so um, f for me, it's, it's really about um, you know, building a body of knowledge through instruction and exercise and uh, trying to maximize that as much as possible. And uh, so what, what I'm going to be talking about is um, some, of the, um, some of the lessons I learned or relearned about how to learn effectively as, a, as an individual. Um, some of my uh, lessons learned, and I'm still learning a lot in, with respect to teaching other people, and then um, how to conduct experiments so that um, the team uh, can actually learn from them without incurring lots of technical debt. And then um, how to manage expectations upward um, when you're introducing uh, functional programming. Um, so some of what, I've, uh, what, what I'm going to talk about is um, some uh, Something, some things that I've picked up from uh, neuroscience and uh, psychology um, uh, readings and, and texts, but I, I'm not a neuroscientist and I'm not a psychologist, um, so just a warning. Okay, so, um, so one of the things that I, I've learned about is, uh, and you know, uh, as I've been relearning how to learn effectively and to pass that knowledge on to my team members, is um, to kind of spread out your learning and repetition of that learning over a, um, a period of time, a uh, number of sleeps. Uh, sleep is actually very vital to memory consolidation. And um, as part of your sessions, you want to start by recalling what you learned the previous time and, of course, restoring, restoring it back in your memory. Um, and so uh, this, is, this technique is called spaced rep repetition. And um, this is actually one, um, one schedule um, that, uh, it's a little bit cut off at the end. Um, but uh, within like a week and a half, um, we can have a, someone who's relatively new to Haskell um, start writing uh, um, Highland morphisms, right? Um, so really all they need on Monday morning, um, the first Monday, is just knowing how to define recursive algebraic data types and then uh, if they know that, then the rest of this is relatively um, simple. And along the way, we're revisiting the previous sessions and um, we're, we're, we're going through um, exercises. Right? So um, something that I found myself stuck in a rut on when I was um, not just learning functional programming but in other ways was that I just tended to reread a whole lot of things and or rewatch um, conference talks, and that's actually not very effective. So, um, so if you're reading a paper, read a section, um, summarize the key points, write them down, check 
that you haven't missed anything of vital importance and that you've actually remembered the right thing, recalled the right thing. Um, uh, devise your own exercises if none exist. So there, there are some you know, texts where um, there aren't any exercises. Um, if you're watching a conference talk, um, pause the, you know, um, of course, not in live conference talks, but uh, on YouTube. Um, pause them, uh, write out all the code, make sure you actually understand it, um, maybe come up with your own exercises, and then you'll be left with an artifact that you can refer to later. And um, do take notes. Um, there, there's actually quite a lot written about how to take notes and stuff, but um, I'll leave that as an exercise to other people. But, um, and I know flashcard sounds like uh, you're becoming a teenager again, right? But, um, uh, but uh, some of the things that, that my team have come up with that they found really valuable is, is some of these examples, for example. Um, and what this will do is um, like improve the recall of like these really, um, th you know, these things that you, if you don't have them available readily, um, you won't be able to see certain patterns um, very, very quickly. Oops. So we're humans, I think, most of us. And as humans, we have um, various predispositions and biases, uh, cognitive biases that uh, lead us down the wrong path. And one of those um, uh, predispositions is the Einstelling effect. And so this is, um, this is where a person has a predisposition to solve a problem in a specific way, even though that specific way is actually not the appropriate way to solve the problem. And so one way, um, some, some ways that this manifests, um, at least I've seen in my job, is uh, you know, just restart the servers um, without investigating, um, because it's just so much simpler than actually getting to the bottom of the problem and actually fixing it. Um, and I always use and then insert whatever your favorite library is. And like alone, out of context, maybe you know it, it does make sense in a certain context, but if you're just always using something out of habit, that's, that's probably not uh, a good thing. You should be questioning some things. And then just put that in the Rails monolith, which is <laughs> my favorite. So um, there's also this thing called functional fixedness. And this is a cognitive bias where um, a person is limited to um, thinking about how they use an object. And this applies to abstract notions as well, only in a way it is traditionally used. So um, this came about from uh, Danker's, I think it's Danker's, Danker's um, candle problem and um, where um, this psychologist gave a box of um, t you know, tacks um, with a candle and some matches and asked participants to um, attach the candle to a wall and light the candle. And of course, um, one of the better, so well, the better solution is to use the box that the tacks come in, but because the box is just containing the tacks, then no, people just don't see any other use for it other than to hold um, these tags there. And so some ways that this actually manifests is you can only deploy nodes to things because they only see you know, blog posts um, that show how to do this, right? Um, and my favorite is um, Haskell is only good for passing or finance, right? Um, and it used to be Haskell is only good for empty set. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so fighting these biases, I've kind of looked at um, some, some texts on uh, complexity theory and, um, you know, uh, taking regular breaks so that when you revisit the problem, you can try and see it from different perspectives. Um, taking a step back and reevaluating if you're actually solving the right problem. Um, asking the right people or, you know, pertinent people um, different questions and then listening very, very carefully. Um, it could be, and this just happened to me last week, uh, my manager told me to do a certain thing, and then I talked to the person who, the you know, the stakeholder involved, and then they're like, 
nah, that's not what I want, right? Um, and so we had a better discussion. I better understood what they needed. And, you know, um, this week while I'm off, my team is delivering something of value to them, right? So, learning to teach. Now, this is something that I still have, uh, I need to do a lot better at. And it's still something that I'm desperately learning um, how to do more effectively. Um, here are just some things that I've learned along the way. So, um, so I used to introduce, um, like a mathematician, like the definition first, and then some examples, and maybe some counterexamples in that order. And um, for my team, my audience, um, this uh, kind of progression, you know, demonstrating examples, showing examples that demonstrate a pattern. And then, um, and then uh, introducing like the more general solution, and then introducing counterexamples. Um, so in this, unfortunately, this is cut off. So I apologize. But um, so here we're introducing a pattern via some examples, and then um, we um, introduce the definition. In this case, semigroup, right? And then we then we work through how do we define uh, the semigroup. Uh, instance for non-empty, and, and that goes fine. Um, and then we introduce some more patterns that demonstrate a pattern, a new pattern. And then we uh, get to a new definition, and then of course, like, what do we do here, right? And, and, and you know, in this particular case, uh, you know, having a, uh, coming up against a brick wall to, to find a, 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 a counterexample really helps um, at least uh, based on feedback from, from my team, um, because then now they understand, oh yeah, like I don't know anything about A unless um, I can create something um, from it, right, an empty thing. And of course, we don't have that ability with non-empty. Okay, so that's just one example, um, but like, it applies to all kinds of uh, counterexamples that uh, we might want to introduce um, for, for different abstractions. So um, we currently have, um, so I'm their manager, so I can tell them how much to spend uh, on things. And um, we, we meet twice a week for um, about an hour. And we work through some examples, we go over some new material in those uh, classes. And, uh, and then I ask them to work on exercises at least 20 minutes a day um, in between. And uh, I try to make sure that they've got enough um, like to work through. And um, we have uh, the exercises um, kind of exercise, you know, the current, what we're currently learning and also prior lessons from quite a while ago. Um, and that, um, that is called interleaving and that's um, thought to uh, improve, um, you know, uh, recall performance, uh, you know, um, for the long term. And that's really what I'm optimizing for. So um, a couple of um, live, we do a couple of live demo exercises in class so that I can demonstrate exactly how to solve a certain kind of problem, but then I make sure that the exercises don't all follow the same pattern um, to break things up so that we don't get back to Einstein effect. Um, so pre-testing is really good for, um, based on um, psychology um, readings. Um, Pre-testing has been shown to be really good for um, gauging progress of um, people, of, of um, learners. And it's also really useful for um, uh, um, j just understanding where people are at, because not everyone is actually, are actually at the same place. So some people will come in at different levels. We've got, uh, there's also some evidence to suggest that unsuccessful recall, uh, retrieval before um, actually being uh, knowing the information can actually help uh, subsequent recall after they know this. Um, Post-testing is kind of part, you know, the other side of um, gauging, you know, progress of uh, different participants and uh, testing. Um, testing actually prompts retrieval. And uh, if you make it a fun, low stakes, no shame kind of environment, then um, this actually uh, improves, um, improves performance. Um, and uh, um, it also provides immediate feedback so that people know whether or not um, 
they, they are really mastering the, the topic, right? And it avoids this notion of uh, illusions of competence. Uh, sometimes people um, will think, oh, I've read this about four times, so I must know it. And if you, all you're doing is, are, is rereading uh, the same paper, um, that may not be um, you know, internalizing it. You may not be uh, deeply learning it. So, um, so that's, that's um, teaching to a group of people, but not necessarily team level learning. Um, so I want my team to be, um, because they're coming into this from uh, a Ruby background, um, some of them, many of them are self-taught, um, so they don't necessarily have computer science background either. And so I want them to feel like a part of um, the conversation as to like how we evolve um, our um, Haskell code bases. And so one of the ways to do that is to create these experiments, um, these safe to fail experiments. And it's totally OK for experiments to, to fail, like in terms of um, showing that the hypothesis doesn't hold. right? But uh, um, at the end of the day, we should be learning something from it. So um, we, you know, we define some kind, of, some kind of hypothesis, something like, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, we can make this faster if we use this streaming library instead of this, right? Which is what we're usually using. Then we design a, some kind of experiment. Um, we have one person who's in charge of that experiment document the results. We scope the experiment to just one package that we're responsible for, not across all of them. And we share recommendations, uh, that person shares recommendations back to the team. The team kind of discusses this, the, the findings. And then depending on whether or not we determine it's a failure or a, or a success, we create tickets to make sure that we don't incur technical debt, right? So, um, so if we've added something that we think is actually a bad idea, we, um, we create like ticket, uh, cleanup tickets um, for that. And if we actually want to employ it more widespread, um, then we create those kinds of um, tickets to to kind of standardize across our um, code bases. And so um, one of the um, really important things is, um, so we, we have to deal with uh, legacy systems and build new, um, new services. And um, as, as um, I, I want to be able to give my team the ability to just focus on what they're good at and not have to worry about the politics. And so my strategy is to try and um, create trust with my management and, so that they leave me alone and they leave the team alone. And so um, one of the, um, I found this kind of recipe successful um, at least the last couple of places um, to, um, to actually look at past failures in the organization. Um, as an example, um, before I joined, there was a telemetry service that was released, and it was shoved into the monolithic Rails app. Um, it, uh, it was uh, unnecessarily coupled with the publishing, the content publishing um, backend. And when the telemetry service received um, too much load, and it failed, Glorious, gloriously, um, it it uh, it took down the publishing backend, right? Which was not what we wanted, right? Um, in addition to that, um, it had to deal with um, intermittent um, disconnectivity with um, the various um, backend systems that it was reporting into, and that was actually expected. Um, but I don't know if you've tried to build any kind of um, you know, fault-tolerant retrying semantics in Ruby, but um, the ecosystem is not full of good solutions there. And, um, and so it, it, it failed in even more glorious ways when other runtime dependencies were not present. Um, so, um, so having a look at um, you know, those failures and, and understanding the pain um, that was inflicted on the team while they were supporting that in production until it was actually removed. Um, you know, proposing a new solution to the core problems, right, in terms of those core pain points. Um, not, and, the, and the solution may be using functional programming, but t 
talking to management, you, sh you shouldn't be saying, oh, well, we'll just use functional programming and this will solve it. Um, it should be instead, well, I want to be able to encode my failure um, semantics um, in a way that I can easily test it, right? And, um, and also, we want to use a, a, a runtime that's, that can do this kind of thing, right, At, from a performance perspective as well. So, um, framing your, so providing evidence, um, like a proof of concept um, level of evidence to show that the solution satisfies the core requirement um, or a core requirement um, goes a long way. And, and actually, that's how I first got Haskell into um, this rail shop. So um, framing your results to your audience. So at the time, I didn't actually know my audience very well, my manager. I had been around for, I don't know, four weeks. And um, I did know that he was technical um, previously, um, but he was a more front-end developer. And so um, I showed him probably too much information, like the benchmarks that I, I sh demonstrated, and, um, and I put together a, a simple uh, proof of concept of um, how to, to write this thing that fails gracefully and uh, stores <coughs> and buffers metrics to be sent on uh, later when the um, runtime requirements are, in fact, available. And it didn't demonstrate the whole solution, but it demonstrated enough of it um, that um, even though he was skeptical about the bus factor problem. Does everyone know what the bus factor problem is? Yeah, OK. Um, even though he was skeptical about the bus factor problem, um, you know, we talked about it, and we came up with a solution in terms of um, you know, how I would go about teaching this kind of stuff. Um, and so we, we worked out a plan, and then we came up with a plan for incremental rollout, and, um, and then that allows me to show management, oops, um, that there are, it's, it's, uh, there are results, right, that we can deliver this way, right, and we can deliver them relatively quickly. And so this increases trust, and then, not always, but usually, um, management just kind of leaves you alone, mostly. And that's the ideal, right? So in, in closing, I had the opportunity to introduce functional programming to a rail shop. Um, it included um, helping other people on the team and myself uh, improve our own individual learning capabilities and practices. Um, it, um, it involved me and other people learning how to teach better. Um, and this still requires a lot more work on my part. It, um, it uh, changed um, the way I thought about um, team decisions, right, and how to um, vary, um, to, to allow exploration um, within the team and to make it more of a team decision. And then um, uh, setting expectations and promoting trust. Um, these are all kind of necessary things, I think, for um, a long-term, sustainable, um, functional project inside of a mainstream sort of um, environment. So thanks. <laughs>